Welcome everybody to this online masterclass, which will be provided by Dr. Vincent Velkamp. Before we get started, uh, I would just like to share a few practical uh, items. Um, if you have a question, please make use of the Q&A functionality. You will find it at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Vincent Velkamp will try to answer uh, all of your questions at the end of the webinar during the live Q&A. And furthermore, this masterclass will also be recorded and we will share the recording, but also the PowerPoint slides with you um, tomorrow or early next week. Um, and now I would like to hand over the virtual floor to uh, Dr. Vincent Velkamp. Hello and welcome to this masterclass on um, balancing big data with smart data. Um, I chose that title because big data is a huge buzzword and in fact, it's sometimes not as useful as it could be, and therefore we have to start thinking smarter. Um, welcome in everybody. I've seen in the list of, uh, of attendees that there are some people that I do know. Welcome back. And I, there are lots of people that I don't know. So welcome uh, first time. And let's see what we can do. I have lots of slides. As you know, the questions are all for the end. Um, and we will have um, we will have this uh, we will have time for questions at the end. So uh, around fifteen forty five uh, local time here in Maastricht, we will make sure that we have a uh, that we, that we stop. Okay. So why am I lecturing this and why uh, why, do, why are you coming here? Well, I am a lecturer at if, of information systems at MSM. Among others, I lecture big and small data. I lecture um, digital transformation. I have lectured supply chain and operations management and management information systems, all of which are uh, heavily interacting, of course, in this kind of topic. Um, how did I end up doing that? Well, I did a master's of science in mathematics at the Free University of Brussels in Belgium. I went on with a, a PhD degree in game theory in Tilburg University in the Netherlands, and then did a postdoc in uh, Jerusalem, a visiting professor in Alicante. I came out of the academia and went uh, into the statistics at Statistics Netherlands. Um, but after two years, I came back to academia and I went into Maastricht University, studied for a moment the new economy, the, the International Institute of Economics that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but I met MSM during that time and came to MSM and I'm here at MSM since 2003 with a short intermission at the uh, Sun Yat-sen University in uh, Kaohsiung. Good. So that's about me. And this is what I wanted to talk about today. So first of all, we wanted to look at uh, big data and then to look at uh, smart data. And of course, big data is um, it should be known to you. So I'm, I'll give a very small uh, introduction to what it is. And then I will discuss its drawbacks and see how we can improve that. And basically the improvement goes through the idea of smart data, which is an acronym actually that Bernard Marr made. And what he means with that is that you have to strategize, you have to measure, you have to analyze, you have to report and you have to transform. And um, yeah, given that we don't have a lot of time, I'm not going to do a lot of things with the analysis and everything, but I do want to talk a little bit about it. So, without further ado, let's look at what this is about. So, we talk a lot about big data these days. And so, yeah, why, why do we talk about big data? Well, before 2000, we had manual data entry. So, data was scarce, data was expensive to generate, and data was power. Now, since then, we have the Internet of Things. We have a lot of sensors that are hanging around on the road. You get flashed and immediately some computer starts sending you a, uh, a, a, a bill for, for a fine and everything. You have RFID tags, you have QR codes, you have CCTV, you have all kinds of operations which are being logged, and you have um, 
these loggings happen in call centers. They happen in points of sales systems of the retailers. They happen in the warehouses. They happen in vehicles. And eventually it is such that data is cheap. The data becomes open because people have so much data and it's so cheap to generate the data that there is no point in, um, in, in hoarding it. And it eventually, we're all getting overwhelmed with big data. And I don't mean overwhelmed with big data as in overwhelmed with the news and the different news that you can hear from all sides, although that's part of it. I also mean that organizations don't have uh, the time to go and analyze all the data that they're actually gathering. So how do they gather that? And where do you get big data? Well. Big data is typically data that you collect for other purposes than analysis. Logs of operations are useful for the operations, for the sales, for the warehouse, for the transport. But it's indirect data acquisition. And if you want to study that, what you have is what you study. You cannot go and regenerate this. You have to use whatever they had. So FedEx has packages data of where the packages were and in which warehouse they are and so on and so forth. And they can use the data to inform their managers and their customers where an actual package is. But if I want to study how, what is the throughput of FedEx and is FedEx uh, doing better than last year, the only thing I have is, is that data. And it may be useful, it may not be useful. Similarly, the government of the Netherlands has the data of the burger service numbers and they have, uh, sounds a bit funny in English, but okay, that's uh, uh, too bad. There's tax data about corporations, tax data about private citizens, but that's basically what they have. And if they want more, they are going to have to uh, send out questionnaires again. Having so much data is obviously going to give you privacy concerns and uh, the GDPR in Europe is one of the set of rules in the world that, that kind of governs what you can do with all the data that you have collected about people. I'm not going to go into the GDPR because that's a whole uh, topic by itself, but we have uh, enough things to do. So given that you collect the data for your operations, the main characteristics of big data is that it's streaming. It's not static data. It's data which has a certain velocity, it updates. And so your question is, yeah, how often? Every second, every minute, every year? If it's every year, then it's like static data. You can do whatever you want. Once you have a version of the data, you can clean it, you can study it, and then next year you get a new version and you can study that. But if it's every second, you're going to have to clean the data. And while you clean the data, more data is coming in. So you can't clean the data in the same way. You have to have a, an active process that makes the data usable as soon as it comes in, which means that the velocity creates the need for new processes. And then if data comes in very fast, the volume of data that comes in is also a problem because it's going to be too much for one computer to store or to handle. And that's why they call it big data. But the, I, for me, the biggest problem for the, of the data is not the size, it's the speed. And, uh, but okay, big data is what they called it. So we'll, we'll call it big data. The second, the third problem that you have is because your data comes in continuously, you're having problem getting it cleaned and it has to be cleaned automatically. So you have to start thinking about how much do I trust my data? How much is it clean? How much are outliers uh, eliminated? Is this authentic uh, data? Uh, because yeah, if you're doing a questionnaire and you have like 30 respondents, you know who the respondents are. But if you have an online questionnaire and, and people are just handing in uh, answers and uh, for, for that questionnaire, you'd, you'd have no idea of who's answering, and that gives you an idea, uh, already an idea of the problem of authenticity and trustworthiness. And then we still haven't talked about the main uh, problem that is that, yeah, you have, of course, text data, like in questionnaires, 
which or like in interviews, which are text or which are sound. And then you have to code them. You have to transcribe them. And that means you have to transform them to analyzable data. You can have images. You can have CCTV video. But having CCTV video of all the attendants in a football match does not mean that you can get the hooligans out of the stadium before they, or that you can keep them out of the stadium before they come in. And that's important. So you, you have to analyze that. And that means that you have a lot of data that comes in different formats that is unstructured, that is not in nice tables that you could, with a bit of uh, uh, goodwill, stick into Excel, for example. And that means that you, you now have speedy, unstructured, high volume, and uh, low trustworthiness data. And the question is, can you make this a valuable uh, proposition? I mean, collecting data, yeah, it's, I'm saying it's cheap, but still there is going to be some, um, some problems in there, right? Where do you have people having big data? Anywhere. In business, but NGOs also, and governments also, you have tax projections, you have a tax brain operation, you have open data initiatives to re enable reuse of data to foster innovation. And uh, the last one I especially want to mention, Gapminder is an organization that tries to visualize how people in the world are living. And this is important because most people have no clue what it means to live in Ghana or in Nigeria or in Pakistan or in uh, Norway. And with Gapminder, you get an idea. So you can see much better that the world is not in two camps, one of developing world and one of developed world. It's actually a continuum. This is something that I wasn't taught in high school or in primary school. And I think still people are being taught, okay, there is a developing world and there's a developed world. This is nonsense. The world is much more fluid these days than it was in 1960. And we know this because the data exists, but nobody shows it anywhere. Okay. How do you create value? Well, I'm not going to go into the details, but for example, the Weather Channel decided that they need to get extra income. And they started looking at their own data that they create. Every day they have data about how good the weather is. And they make projections in the future. How uh, how much rain can we expect? And how, how warm is it going to be? How cold is it going to be? And they figured out that they can sell that data to people who make financial futures about agricultural uh, success rates of farmers. Walmart started figuring out how to use data and outcompeted its um, competitor, e.g. Kmart, which went bankrupt. So these huge companies, they started collecting data for their operations and then started analyzing the data and making the operations more efficient, which is what you want to do also. Siemens predicts failures and maintenance of devices. GE does the same thing with their wind turbines. Facebook has adverts for small and medium businesses, which actually you don't need to tell them whom to show the advert to, because these adverts select their own audience. They they measure, or Facebook measures it for them, of course. So Facebook shows the adverts to people. And in the beginning, it shows them to a lot of people who are not interested. But then they start measuring who is interested, who's clicking through. And they have they cluster people together. These people are interested in that advert, and the other people are not. So for the people who want to advertise, they only want to show that advertisement to people who actually might click on it. And Facebook wants to show the ads to people who want to click on it also because then they make some money. So it's in the interest of Facebook to serve the SMEs by having a service whereby the SMEs don't need to know their own audience. Facebook tells them the audience. Airbnb studies their apartments, studies what kind of apartments are good, what kind of apartments are bad, where to open other apartments. It knows exactly uh, if you're a frequent uh, user of this, it knows what kind of things you like, but it also knows which cities 
and what type of apartments in which cities it should uh, develop, right? Nest smart thermostats try to save people uh, petrol or diesel or whatever you're using to heat your home with or to cool your home with. Um, you need to save energy and Nest is analyzing how your house reacts to these settings on the thermostats and thereby makes uh, makes makes things better for the owners and the livers in the houses. Quill is a website which turns graphs and images into narrative, which is exactly the opposite of what Dali does and what Midjourney does, but it's something that is extremely important also. Yeah, I should have put those two in there. Anyway, so the big question is, if the unicorns, the $1 billion businesses, are using so much data, to make their business model uh, more efficient and to make it more profitable, how can traditional organizations or SMEs compete? Can we emulate this? And the answer is, well, yeah, because it's not about the velocity, it's not about the volume of the data, it's about smart use of data. And even if you're not that big and so you have smaller data, you could still make your data work for you. And so what Bernard Marsh says in his book, which is called Big Data in Practice or Big Data, yeah, two books, and then there's several um, chats on YouTube that he makes, um, is he says, okay, we, we are going to look at what data we need. We're going to strategize about the data. Then we're going to measure it, analyze it, report it, and transform. And... Yeah, I said, wait a moment, wait a moment. Big data means that it has been collected for other reasons. But that doesn't mean that we cannot analyze, sorry, that we cannot measure other data that we do need to have. Yeah, and so what he says is we need to strategize and he makes a smart strategy board where you have a purpose. Um, what is it you want to do? You have customers. What Customers, do we actually want to have? Are we looking for the uh, elderly? Are we looking for young people? Are we looking at people in uh, rich countries? Are we looking at people in countries that are growing faster? What do we actually want? Yeah? And what are we offering those people? Once you know those two things, you can say, hey, wait a moment, if we want to give a certain service, we are going to need suppliers, we're going to need distributors, we're going to need partners. What kind of partners do we need and what kind of relationship do we need to, to have with those partners? What kind of processes do we have to uh, develop in order to generate demand and to fulfill the demand, to fulfill the regulatory, the social and the legal requ requisites of the places that we want to operate in? All of those processes are, of course, going to be costly. So you have to know about the cost. And this is a data issue. You have to know which of the processes are costly and therefore which of the services are costly. And then you have to know which of the services are bringing profit and bringing revenue. And once you have those two, you can go and have a look at the IT systems and the data, or actually you have to... The part of the process is, is the IT systems and the infrastructure and the people and the talent which you need in order to be able to develop the services you want to give to your customers, right? And all of those resources are going to be part of the costs and they are going to deliver you your revenue and profit unless the risks uh, materialize that you have that you're going to work under uh, financial risks always ex exists uh, it risks it can be minimized people risk uh, and market risk are things that happen and that you have to look at so this panel is not something new for a strategizer what is new is the part where you ask, okay, what are we going to need? What go, what data are we going to need in order to run those processes? So what kind of data sources do we need? What kind of networks do we need to transport the data? What kind of systems do we need to store the data, to analyze the data? And uh, so 
Those are important questions, which have to be answered. So you could have questions like, who are our customers? What are the demographics of valuable customers? What's the lifetime of customers? You're going to tell me, yeah, but if I have a web shop, I know. Yes, that's true. If you have a web shop, you know. But if you're a regular shop, what if you're a shop on the corner here, just outside uh, MSM? How do you know what is the demographics of your customers? You don't know, because the only thing you know of your customers is whether they pay by card or whether they pay cash. For the rest, you, you see what they eat. But you don't see what the, the demographics. If I pay cash every time I go to the co-op, nobody knows that I'm the same customer. If I pay by card, yeah, then they know it's the same customer. So then they start to have some demographics. So that's also one reason why they prefer card payment, why they like uh, uh, fidelity cards. But it's not useful to know only what people are paying or what is being sold and everything. That's there. Okay, you need that for your operations, but it does not tell you how you're going to make me a better customer. So you need to look at, for example, at the retail shop and you, you have the sales data, which is big. You have the payment data, which is big, but it doesn't answer how many people are actually passing the shop. And of those, how many stop to look in the window? How long do they look? How many come into the shop? How much do they buy? Yeah, this last one you have the answer to. The, the fourth one you don't have the answer to because if people don't buy, you don't know. So you need to do more data collection. What kind of data collection did Bernard Marsh suggest? Well, he said, okay, let's see if we can track the mobile phones which are passing in front of the shop. And by doing that, you have two pieces of data. You have the number of mobile phones and you have how long does a mobile phone stay in front of the window. So you can see not only the passerby, you can see the number of window gazers and you can exactly see how long they have been window gazing. <clears throat> so then he said, okay, that's good, but not good enough because we want to know how many look into the window? Well, window gazers apparently are looking into the window unless they have a meeting in front of your uh, shop and then they're not looking into the window necessarily. So what he added was cameras, which are aimed at the street. If you have cameras pointing into the street, you can see whether people, you can recognize, you can analyze that stream and you can see how people, uh, how many are looking at the window, how long they look, and where they, they look. look. Are they looking at the left or are they looking at the right? Are they looking at the top? And so your whole window dressing can be measured now. You can measure what do you put in your window versus whether people actually look. As a result, the conversion rate from passerby to sales went way up. They could test window displays. They could remodel the, the window displays, the, the, the window decorations and they could remodel the offers that they show in the windows with the result that they massively increased retail sales per shop and they closed one shop because there was no foot traffic well if there's no foot traffic there's not much that you can do with window dressing unless you have a lot of advertisement outside the shop in other places to make them come there but apparently it was not in the right place so two small iot devices which are not even that expensive manages to give a retail uh, chain store, to be honest, because I mean, one shop uh, cannot close itself, right? So it's a chain store, um, but they, they manage to improve the, the sales and the profitability per shop. So that's really very, very useful. And what you can then see is, okay, we, we need, to have the nice fruit. We need to have the pairs, right? The, the nice outcomes. We can compare the outcomes to pairs. We can compare the resources that you need to the tree trunk and to the roots. <clears throat> and therefore, you have to realize that you're not going to get nice outcomes unless you have the trunk and the roots, meaning the HR, the IT systems, the operations, the customers, uh, the finance, and uh, so you, you have to build a whole system 
before you get nice pairs. The trunk is crucial. You have to do the market research. You have to design. You have to have new products and new services. You have to have market information, customer relationship management. And I'm not going to mention all the things that are on this slide, but fulfilling demand, regulatory and social requirements have to be satisfied. And you can only do that with a good organization, with good processes and with good employees. So adding on the digital part is very nice, but you actually have to have good in, in uh, good implementations. In order to get the good implementations, if we go back a few slides, we see this panel. Let's go through the different panels that we have in this slide. And we see that the first thing we need to look at is the purpose panel. So let's look at the purpose panel. What do you want to achieve in your department? What do you uh, achieve now? What do you want to achieve later? What kind of audience do you want to reach? What is your unique selling point? And you need a, 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 a statement of purpose. You need a long-term ambition. And after you have that, you can say, hey, which way, which are the customers that we are going to look at? Which segment? Are we looking at demographics? Are we looking at geography? Uh, why are you doing that? Uh, and having the data will tell you the why. In the value proposition, why do people actually buy from you? Is it because of the price? Is it because of the quality? Is it because of service? How do you increase customer satisfaction? Which are the customers that are not satisfied and that are churning? What is your best target customer? The lifetime. What service is valued? What do people actually like from what you're giving them? And this is very, very important because one of the things that Apple, for example, changed in the music industry is it stopped, well, it, it never started selling CDs. What it did was it sold single tracks. And although that's an old business model, the, the move from CDs to tracks that you buy and that you can play on Apple Music is much more, uh, is much bigger change than to go from Apple Music to Spotify. Because what Apple figured out was that people don't want albums. They want one track on the album, and that's why they buy the album. And they said, well, if you want to have only tracks, we're going to sell you specific tracks. And uh, they had to find the music industry to get it done, right? But they knew because they had that service, they could see that some people or most people don't buy all the tracks on one album. And if you give them the choice of buying an album or buying single tracks, they buy single tracks. So that's very, very important. Then you can have a look at uh, the questions that you can ask in finance. What's the profit margin for a certain product? What is the optimal investment strategy? Is your business model accurate? Are the assumptions of the business model correct? What's the cost of production, the cost of delivery? And they, most people don't know, yeah? Most SMEs, don't know exactly what is the cost of certain things. And they are guessing. They know overall how well they're doing, but they don't have the detail. And that is something that you need to have if you want to uh, optimize your product mix. In the operations, obviously, you're going to, to need suppliers, but which ones are the crucial ones? Are you going to do single sourcing? Are you going to go multiple sourcing? Are you going to look at distributors? Or are you going to sell yourself? Do you have intermediaries? What kind of inter relationship do you have with your intermediaries? What kind of NDAs did you make them write? What kind of uh, long-term contracts did you uh, promise them? And uh, who, who has the best competencies to do certain things? What gaps are there in your production system, in your service system? How do you fill those gaps? Do you hire people? Do you hire an, uh, an intermediary? Um, how do you know who has those, uh, those knowledge? And which processes need perfecting? Amazon is an excellent example of this. Amazon knows exactly which of their processes are actually efficient and which are not. And you know how? It's very simple. Whenever you want to set up a shop, you can go to Amazon and say, I want to use part of your services. I want to use your warehousing, your logistics, and your billing. 
And they say, okay, for warehousing, you pay so much. For building, you pay so much. And for the logistics, you pay so much. And then you start saying, hey, wait a moment, wait a moment. I can get logistics from somebody else. And it's, it's better than from Amazon. So I'm not taking that. So Amazon is renting out their services. And if they are successful at renting out their own internal services, they actually know that they are efficient. And they measure this. For a huge conglomerate, this is extremely difficult to measure because everything is sourced internally, and then you don't know how efficient it is, right? <clears throat> so all these things, they have to be measured, and uh, finally you get to the, the, the resources. So ICT and data, well, the data is the one that you collect, and the ICT is what you're storing it in and what you're using to analyze it and what you're using to transport it. And all of that needs to be running on some infrastructure like your Wi-Fi or your in your network and everything. And then you have to look at the talent. And that's something that's um, currently in the Netherlands is, is a huge problem here because on the one hand, the Dutch government says, yeah, we want less foreign students. And on the other hand, you have companies like ASML, which says, yeah, but we don't have enough Dutch candidates to come and work for us. So we want to hire more people. And if you're going to make it more difficult for people to come to the Netherlands, we might have to leave. And now the Dutch government does not want ASML to leave. So there is this huge yeah, negotiation going on. And uh, hopefully ASML wins and uh, gets more openness from the Dutch government because, frankly speaking, MSM is living... Uh, from people that want to go to ASML. Now, not only, of course, but I mean, we have the same goal. We want to open up the Dutch uh, uh, markets for foreigners and everything. So that's, that's very interesting. You have to be an, a model employer and uh, you can you can see this in the newspapers that yeah people are being poached from this company from that company and uh, and people are fright frank uh, uh, are are desperately looking for talent and so maybe you are sitting in the vegetable industry and you want to have people who know how to work with finance better so you have to go and poach them from other industry sectors. People can hire people, uh, uh, employees from Google. Of course, you'd have to give them the right salary for that, right? Um, but yeah, the HR needs to know which employees are churning, which employees are uh, giving a good uh, brand image to us or not. Um, can we have Steve Jobs as a manager? Because yeah, Steve Jobs is a brilliant uh, innovator, but as a manager, he was sometimes difficult to live with. So there's all kind of uh, issues there. Yeah, there is also the, the, the distributed leadership of Google. We're going to come and see what that is in a moment. Um, and then there's the competition. You have to know what your competition is. Now, this is very much strategic, and so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But basically, you have to measure all those things. You really want not to guess, but you want to know how the competition is eating your lunch and what kind of regulatory effects the laws have on your operations and the operations of your competition and everything, of course. And then you need to look for smart answers. And now I mean really smart answers, not the abbreviation smart answers. I want, and you want, to have good answers which separate the essential from the inessential, which have relevant data, which can open the communication and which can guide the discussion. And so you can have evidence-based discussions. So you want to open your sales to France, fine, but you need to know how this is going to happen. And you can do the analysis first and not spend millions of dollars uh, trying to enter the country and then look at, 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 at the huge expensive failure. So for each panel in the smart board, you want to have two to five smart questions and you need the key personnel to be involved so that they get, first of all, buy-in, you get better answers, and then you use your smart questions to guide the data needs. 
For example, Google wanted to have uh, HR managers or didn't want to have HR managers. What are HR managers? Well, they're supposed to help your people, your employees have better careers, right? Any HR always has data and Google likes metrics, they likes to analyze. In their PyLab research uh, institution, they, had, uh, they were doing transformative R&D and they started it without any HR manager, but that didn't work. So they brought in HR managers, but they were not being respected by the employees. So they did some research. How do you know an HR manager adds value? The research was done during double blind interviews. They found good managers and they found criteria which make good managers. You're going to tell me, yeah, wait a moment, good coach. If you go through this list, good coach empowers team, expresses interest, productive communicator, helps the career, blah, 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 blah. These are all the obvious answers. Or are they not obvious? Well, yeah, if I tell you these are the ones that Google wants, you're going to tell me, yeah, sure, I would want that also in any company. The thing is, there are many more answers that you would want of a good uh, manager, but these eight make the greatest impact. So Google measured and said, okay, we want to have managers which can do this. Anything else is uh, a nice extra, but this is what we want. So we're going to train the managers to become good coaches, empowering, no micromanagement, uh, clear vision, has the tech skills. And um, they found out that, yeah, their HR managers didn't have the training to, to do all those things. They did not have a consistent approach because little time was spent on communicating that this should be the management staff. So they said, yeah, let's uh, make a training program for the managers. We give them training and then we give them awards and then we give communication plans and we see uh, we see what is happening in there, right? And then um, I'm running a bit late, so I, I have to go faster. Um, uh, then you can see what are the questions that you need for the data? Well, for example, you can ask questions like, okay, what do people think of our services? What's the customer lifetime? What services value most? And there are different ways in which you can collect the data. You can do survey research, you can do transactional research, you can look internally in the company, you can look at sensors, what can they collect for you? You can experiment, you can look at social media, you can do eyeball tracking of people that you make read certain uh, pages on web pages or the, the windows, then you can, you can check all kinds of biometrics. So there are different options that you have in collecting data. In finance, you have all the usual uh, suspects in data. In supply chain, you have transactional data, you have facial data, recruitment uh, interviews, and um, you have crowd control data, so CCTV data. In search engines, 20% of daily searches seem to be new. So, hey, you cannot optimize that too much. So what you want to have answered about the data that you need is, Okay, per question that you want to answer, you're going to need data, maybe one, two, three, five data sets. You need probably this data set, if it exists, has a name, and otherwise you're going to give it a name. You're going to have to say what kind of data it is, structured, unstructured, um, is it visual, is it text, is it whatever. How are you going to store this? Where are you going to store this? Is it fast data? Is it trustable data? Uh, what kind of data volumes are you going to put it on? Are you going to put it in the cloud or locally? Things like that, right? And then uh, once you have answers to those other questions, you have answers to the last one, which says, okay, what is it going to cost to create that data, to have the data? And the fun thing is that a lot of data is structured, but more data in volume is unstructured text with photos, videos, websites, and everything. And one of that is, for example, this movie of the, uh, the cafe, which is actually looking at their customers on the left. And one customer has been sitting one hour, 15 minutes, and another, uh, and, and one of the servers has made 10 cups. Lena has made 10 cups. Also, Anna has made 20 cups. 
And if this is all in the same an amount of time, then you see that Anna has been much more productive in cup making than the others. Now, of course, it's not the only thing that you have to do when you're standing behind there, because there are people here that make sandwiches, they don't make cups, so it wouldn't be fair to judge people on the number of cups they make. But you see that, yeah, uh, some companies are starting to use videos to see how efficient their workers are, or how slow their drinkers are because these ones are here from 15 minutes and this one an hour and 15 minutes and you know how many cups they drank so if they don't drink a, a cup per quarter of an hour you might want to slowly push them out of the door if you are mcdonald's right so there's a lot of internal data which is excellent usually because you have taken a lot of uh made a lot of effort to collect it and this is a bit undervalued. And while the the, the 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 data that comes from outside is a bit of a hype. So AdWords, trends, social media profiles, Twitter census, and weather. Yeah, those things exist. And you can make something out of them. But don't forget about your internal data. And don't forget that you can make data out of things that you did not use to collect before or that you did not measure before. For example, browser logs, Facebook tracking, double click follows you through the internet. That's what cookies are for, for tracking you. Shopping records gives feedback to shops. So fidelity cards, whatpad.com is where you can write and read novels and uh, gives feedback to the authors. Netflix exactly knows which minute of which episode people switch off from a certain series. Kindle knows exactly where people are reading, what people are reading. Fitness bands could be used by health insurance. Sleep data could be used uh, also by health insurance or by, uh, by, by, uh, by fitness uh, clubs or something. And then you have all these conversations in Twitter, in Tumblr, and uh, with or without pictures. These are incredibly, there's a lot of data and it didn't used to be anything done with it. Now. Uh, after Typhoon Haiyan, you apparently have UK volunteers classifying social media pics to create a damage map. Now, that's very, very useful, right? So where do you get all that data? Well, you have sensors. For example, Rolls-Royce looks at sensors to see how well their motors are working. And I'm not meaning in the Rolls-Royce cars, but actually in plates, right? Internet of Things. I've been told since the year 2000 that my uh, fridge is going to have sensors knowing what's in there. Hasn't happened, but on the other hand, lights have sensors now, ovens have sensors, TVs, AC, cams, door locks, many things have sensors, which is not totally understandable whether it's really very useful. All of those can be hacked probably, so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a, a risk doing that, but yeah, all those sensors could also be used to show people ads that are specifically for them. So billboards in Japan react to passersby and they see if it's a woman passing or a man passing, so they get a, a ad aimed at women or not at women. Traffic lights in the Netherlands react to the traffic in in Spain also, but in an, in in a completely different way. In Spain, if you drive too fast, the light will change to red. In the Netherlands, if you approach, then it will slowly change the green. So similar things. Um, <clears throat> so what basically what we need is smart data, not necessarily big data. What we need is, uh, first of all, internal structured data, because it's, as you go down this list, it becomes much less usable, right? So external unstructured data, that's what a lot of people make a lot of fun with, but it's more difficult to use. And so typically I would focus first on A, B, C, D rather than the others. And then there is a lot of data collection. I'm going to go a bit faster now because there's different ways of creating data. There is different ways of analyzing data. But what is really the first important step, and I think that's what we really should focus on here is if you want to 
have useful data, you have to start strategizing what data you need to collect and what data you can uh, analyze. And you can analyze in different ways. You can have med med uh, radiologists, which are better as a computer these days. You have CCTV cameras in London. You have elderly people in assisted housing who are independent, but there's a safety camera that sees if they if they fall and stay down too long. Yeah, and then they can do inferential analysis. Here's an example of an analysis where biological data gets clustered and automatically clustered, in fact, because there is a visual program that you can easily learn to use which helps you find what variables to use to cluster I amino mean, out of 20 different variables they find variables that really show that you have three different groups of uh, of data here and this is another one um the r in smart is about reporting and my advice there would be you have to visualize you have to make dashboards and this is not something that you have to let managers do on their own. You have to have organizational support. Procter & Gamble made dashboards like the one in the bottom here. You need to have one visual language. So they made 180,000 dashboards. And they all look similar. They are about different products, but they all look similar. And that means that you can go to your neighbor and you can understand their dashboard immediately which is very important. And the T of the SMART means you have to transform. So you can transform into a data-driven organization, which means you know things before others do. And that means you improve your processes, you do better things, you do, you may, for example, a 15-year-old girl made breast cancer diagnosis, 99% correct. <clears throat> better than doctors do, yeah? So there are all kinds of things that are uh, fun to do that are uh, a little bit technical also, but you have to strategize. So you have to start strategizing if you want to have smart data, you have to ask the smart questions, redesign your data collection and usage, analyze, report, and transform, and then start all over because by the time you've done that, things have changed, other types of sensors have appeared, other types of uh, habits have appeared, and that means that you can never stop with digitizing your organization. I have said what I wanted to say. I'm going to go for the question time. Let's see what you have as the questions. We have 16 questions and seven have been answered. Uh, yeah. So let's see if I put my the questions on this here, you can probably see what is happening. What's the best method to convince people to finish a survey, but also to have accurate data? Oh, this is a, a very tricky question. Um, if you can convince them of the usefulness of the survey, then they will be more motivated. Uh, you could um, try telling a little bit about how it's going to help the world to know what you want to know. Um, you you have to insist uh, that, the, yeah, the, 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 there's a tendency, no, there's a temptation to start paying people. Right? Like if, you, if you fill this, I will enter you for a lottery, but then, yeah, the accuracy might go down. So that's a bit uh, difficult, maybe. Is, I think you you a, a good cover letter can help a lot. And also what you could do is to tell people, look, if you answer this, I'm going to give you access to the results. So if people are interested in knowing the results of a survey that they have answered, then you get automatically, you, you, you come and you see the, you see that people will get uh, more an interest. Second question is, how do you know that you collect the right data? Well, you don't know. The only thing that you have to look at is, are you doing the right thing as a company? So you want to, you want to know 
how to serve your customers better, that means that you have to look at uh, yeah, what data do you need for that. Different people will have different answers to that, but there is no one right data, right? And in, 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 in business, in organizations, you try to do the best you can, but that doesn't mean that you're going to have the best answer immediately. It may have it may take years to find the right question. So I'm not I don't know how you know that you have the right one, but you have a better one than the year before. And that's what is important. How about privacy issues? Yeah, that's a that's a good one. If you are um, in Europe, you have the GDPR, and GDPR actually gives a huge fines if you don't treat privacy properly. So <clears throat> you have to have a legal department that looks at privacy issues and that looks at how long you can keep the data that you are collecting. That's the legal answer. Now there is another answer, and that's ethically, uh, what can you do, uh, have data for? And that is another one because in Germany, it was not illegal for Google, for example, to have Google Maps show the um, the actual house view. But the Germans are notoriously itchy about privacy. So there was a lot of protests. And if you look at how many streets Google has digitized in Europe, there is a huge difference between Poland, France, and on the other side, Germany. Germany has very little uh, Google Earth data, Google, Google Street View, uh, compared to France or Belgium or Netherlands or Poland. So there's an ethical issue. So you, you have to make sure that when you collect data, you assure people that, okay, whatever is their personal data is not going to be collected. And if you aggregate, you're more able to have uh, to 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 show this uh to 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 keep the data than if you uh, keep private privately uh, if you keep, then if you keep data which allows people to uh to identify the the um, yeah so it's it's a, it's a difficult question So privacy issues twice uh, regarding the speech of, of data changing. Um, will the stock market change the current way of functioning? Um, speak, uh, stock markets have already changed. If they went from paper and uh, hand waving to electronic stock markets. So yeah, I mean, people are paying a lot of money to have a location for a broker firm, which is actually nanoseconds away from the New York stock market, so from Wall Street. So the closer you are to Wall Street, the higher the rent is because of the nanosecond differences that it makes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, stock markets are changing. I would expect them to start working weekends also or to start working around the clock, given that it's less and less people making uh, manual transfers and more and more people uh, self-help. I mean, there is no reason why something like uh, 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 Robin Wood or uh, what is it, Robin Wood or whatever that, that stock market uh, app in the States why they can only make trades during the opening hours of the New York Stock Exchange when it's all individuals making small stock trades uh, in their free hours. Is cryptocurrency the answer? Um, to the increasing... Well, cryptocurrency and blockchain in general is... Uh, important, I think. And uh, unfortunately, cryptocurrencies have a tendency to fluctuate up and down. And then uh, in some years, you have people uh, hyping them too much. And in some years, people forget to even uh, forget that they exist. Uh, I think that blockchain is going to be very interesting. Uh, 
has certain applications, but in the years where Bitcoin is high, like uh, this month, um, you see that everybody wants to change their operations to a blockchain. And I don't think that's necessary. Some databases are better off staying private. Some databases are better off being transparent. For example, the database where you keep track of how a tomato has grown in Jordan until it comes into a Albert Heijn in the Netherlands, I would like that one to be open. It is not. On the other hand, if I am a company uh, uh, handling uh, uh, the, the passport issuing of uh, the Netherlands, uh, I know the UAE has their passports on the blockchain. I'm not sure I want that. I'm, I would think that there's no need for a blockchain. You can have a transparent database, but I think this database should be carefully managed only by the government and not by others. And then one, one reason why you have blockchains is that many people can put things on that, uh, many, may, can put documents on the blockchain. Not sure. So cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency is also not very fast. I mean, Bitcoin certainly not very fast, but they have been working on speeding it up. There are blockchains like Ripple, which are lightningly fast. I don't think speed of payments is a, is an issue um, in there. So I'm I'm not I'm not sure I have a, Bernard, a, a full answer to what your uh, question is, but we will see. Delano says, uh, why is it important to compare big with small data and which data is most important? Well, the thing is that small data is what you get if you do manual data collection and big data is what you do when you automate the data collection. And you could have the same data collected in both ways uh, unless it's impossible to automate. Like for example, if I want to have a questionnaire and I want to see which people are, what people think about um, the Netherlands or something, yeah, you, you need to find people that actually have thoughts about the Netherlands. And I could make an online questionnaire, but the, 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 it's, it's not really easy to see if it's going to fall in the right hands and how much I can trust it. So that's, they, they, they have different applications uh, in, in that sense. Why is it important to compare? Well, I don't need to compare them. I would use both, first of all. And second, if you... Um, it, it, what, what, what is different between them is that the, the methodology of analysis is much easier with big data than with small data. And that sounds contradictory, but it is true. In small data, you have to make a lot of assumptions about the data. In big data, you don't need those assumptions because the methodologies, their algorithms are different. And, and, and that makes it much, much better to have big data than to have small data. Um, the difference between ICT and data. So ICT is um, information and communication technology. And this is technology. So this is my computer, it's my screen, it's my laptop, it's my phone, it's the servers and everything. The data is whatever you store in there and that you use to make decisions with. So uh, for making passports, the government of the Netherlands has a lot of data on their own citizens. So information, data, um, nearly the same thing. And uh, the ICT is the whole network of computers and uh, communication lines between those computers that they use to print those passports. Ethics, ah, well, ethics is very, very important. And algorithm programming is um, problematic in that it programs whatever people have as biases. So if you, a very stupid example is they had a company which was going to automate its HR recruitment. And they figured out that they could do this with an algorithm. <clears throat> the algorithm was going to look at who is the successful 
which type of people are the successful people in the company. And turned out that that was the kind of uh, obnoxious white males. So the algorithm concluded we have to hire more obnoxious high, uh, white males. Now, ethically, that's a bit problematic and uh, uh, it might not even be productive in the sense that all those obnoxious white males, they are like a, a nuclear bomb going off and you need some more um, cooperative types to go between them and uh, let alone that it's not ethical not to hire any women, of course, right? And let alone people of other color. So the, 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 yeah, they... They didn't program the algorithm to become racist and, xeno and, and, and xenophobic and misogynic, but it, that was the res end result. So there are studies where people have looked into how do you make my algorithms better? Um, employment brand image and employer brand image. Um, I think they're very, very similar. Um, one is more about the job and one is more about the employer, I think, but I'm not a marketing expert, so I will leave that open. Open source in addition to government public statistics. Um, Adnan, I would say uh, this changes every day. You have to go and Google those. Even Google has open data, but the UN has uh, open data. Um, it depends on what you want to have it for. But there is a lot of there are a lot of governments who keep track of what kind of open data there is. Data privacy in the digital economy and e-commerce. Oh, well, this is, of course, the big fight nowadays. Everybody wants their data privacy, private, and they start to, the, the public starts to realize that data privacy is an issue, but companies depend on knowing their customers. So... Hmm. Uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Dr. Valkamp. I would say we have time for two more questions at this moment. Yes, and we have 23 open ones. Uh, Aldi South, um, I'm not going to say anything about that because you know yourself that this is going to give a problem to video your employees. Um, I, I don't know the legal uh, things here. Um, explaining with analyzing power BI. No, I'm not going to explain this. You should come to MSM and then we will explain that to you. Um, the, the, the COVID. Accurate data collection. Ah, well, COVID. Uh, there is a lot of uh, of of uh, COVID issues. Smooth and accurate data collection. Well, the the one one of the problems in the COVID era was that nobody knew how to count dead people with COVID. The Germans and the English had a hugely different uh, interpretation, and therefore their COVID numbers differed. Um, it's 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 a very interesting question, but it needs more time to answer. Navigating ethical considerations. Ah, well, very carefully, I would say, ask a lawyer, and not, don't ask me. Tools: Power BI and Tableau for visualizing, and Orange Three for uh, analyzing the data. There's open source tools. Highlight innovations. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Social credit in China, very dangerous. Inside the GDPR would forbid that. GDPR. I think legally we are running behind the actual activities. Um, and then Bob asks about using AI for data analysis. It exists. GT Chat GPT four claims it can do that. I haven't experimented with it yet. I'm. I don't know about. I don't know about Nigeria. How you're going to do that? I need to have more data uh, for that. And uh, also. Um, it's it's going to be be quite uh, quite a, uh, a difficult thing. Distributed leadership, uh, no time for that. Um, we have an EP course in big data analysis. It ran last week. We also have, of course, courses during the MM and the MBA that on these topics. Uh, one long survey, well, you have the chance that people turn off. 
if you have two short ones, you don't have the same people answering both. So they both have their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, given that you have lived in the data, I would say start collecting. Make it make make um, make the 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 powers that be uh, understand the importance of having data. If you don't know, you cannot improve things. And the, that's the last question that I'm answering is a strategizing process. Yes, this is the, the if you don't start choosing what data to collect and to analyze, you can't talk about smart data. That would be my last answer. Thank you very much for being okay. here. If you have further <laughs> questions, we have, of course, my email here and you can you're welcome to uh, send more questions over there. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Veldkamp, for this uh, insightful masterclass and also for trying to answer as many questions as possible. Um, <laughs> um, as indeed um, Dr. Veldkamp already mentioned, if your question is not answered or you have any additional questions, uh, please feel free to contact him on the email address provided on the last slide. Um, I would also like to mention again that we will share the recording and the uh, slides with you afterwards. You can expect the email uh, tomorrow or uh, early next week. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for joining. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope to welcome you again in any of our future online masterclass classes. The next one will take place on the 7th of May, uh, provided by uh, Dave Cass on the topic of design fiction. Um, and keep an eye on our website for the, the invitations and our social media channels, of course, that you can find all the latest updates also about our online masterclasses. Um, yeah, thank you again, Dr. Veldkamp. Thank you to everybody for joining. And uh, hopefully we see you in our next online masterclass. Thanks a lot. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs>